Welcome. Welcome everyone to part four of the city building and, and the sustainable development goals class. So I think this, uh, this time has really gone quickly. James, how are you feeling with the, with how the class really is good. going? And I actually really love um, how the class has progressed, especially last week when we were able to get Eric to show us how to build on different levels. I think that was a really awesome part. And it's a good segue into what we'll be talking about today as well, which is to further develop our character living in the city. So we're pretty excited. Uh, and how are you feeling, Eric? I'm, I'm, I'm energized today. You're good. So, uh, You're good. You are good. You're going to bring <laughs> the energy for us. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Yes, Can you yes. do a quick re recap for us, Lindsay? Yeah, so last week uh, we focused a lot on starting to work from the micro scale of just building a single building and expanding your city. So thinking about making multiples of the same building, but Eric actually helped even zoom in with much more simplized, simple projects where he made a, a stack of cubes, basically kind of like building blocks, but with strawbies, wireframed building blocks, and even used a piece of paper to create like a grid system and even made these tiny, tiny little citizens on pieces of paper that you can scale. So he had like one that was like maybe mm. about one centimeter and then one that was about three centimeters tall. So you got to kind of understand the perspective, also the size of your city from the citizens view. So it was like a prototyping session for how your citizens would interact in your city. And then Eric also showed us how to build a super tall tower, which I, I see behind you. Is that the tower that was featured last week, Eric? I, I think it's still standing there. We haven't uh, yes. touched it. <laughs> Actually, we're doing, so next week, we're going to try to break a record. So it's going to be sent mm. live also for anybody who's interested. We'll post it. Uh, nice. We're going to try to break our record in, in the tallest building we've ever built with Strawby. So I, my personal goal is for the structure to break in the bottom from the own, its own weight. The weight. So, mm. so then we know how far we can go with using nothing extra, just the just the straws and connectors. I love it. So where can we find that live? Is it going to be on the Strawbies page? Strawbies yeah, Educators I think, page? Uh, so that's the thing. It's Vivian, uh, marketing Vivian. She's going to mm -hmm. post it once it's nailed down, but it's on Tuesday anyway. So we'll try to make sure it's around this time mm -hmm. uh, so people can join in from around the world. Uh, okay. Well, so to find, that, to find that information, we'll be posting on the Strawbies Educators yeah. group. So maybe check into that Facebook page and we'll make sure that you can immediately find that video. And there's going to a lot of people from Strawby's uh, office is going to be joining in that experiment. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Always playing at work at Strawby's <laughs> HQ. So, uh, so today what we're going to be focusing on is a few, is a few actual activities to expand and also give you a little bit of uh, homework to work with. So we're going to be focusing on creating, uh, zooming in more on the, the citizen sheet. So James is going to be leading you through a citizen character sheet that you'll design for the citizens that live in your city. And Eric and I are going to be going over how to recreate your city into a smart city. So thinking about how you can Im Im uh, apply Quarkbot or Microbit with the robotic inventions board that we have just launched. So a lot that we're going to be going over today. So James, would you like to get us started on the citizen sheet? Sure, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. Now, if you guys do remember, this is the Story City website that we provided to the first two seminars, and we discussed a little bit about this. Now, this is a fantastic website because you can actually go ahead and use this hashtag to upload all of your city building narratives. And what I mean by narratives is you can actually create a storyline where you can update what is going on on a day-to-day -day basis within your city? And that's a really cool idea because if you want to collaborate with a classroom, if you want to collaborate with other teachers, you can set it up so that in, well, three weeks or maybe three months time to have a framework as to how your city is being developed through certain characters. Now, what I mean by certain characters, there's actually a really, really awesome narrative going on here. As you can see, there's lots of little dolls, lots of little pictures of an, an instance within the city. So here you can actually see them describing what is going on every single day. Now, as you can see, one of the examples here, um, they just list out, they had a really busy day and they're going to the store to get breakfast from Ali. So they actually name each character and they actually go through their routine of what they're doing. Now, remember how Eric discussed 
different perspectives within city. This would be the first person perspective, being able to adapt and being able to tell a story within a city. Now, most of these um, have the first person narrative, but you also have um, people just showing how they're building smart cities and using some technologies. And that's also gonna be a fantastic um, place to get some inspiration and to be able to share some of your thoughts. And we'll do a little bit more sharing with Lindsay as well as Eric later on. Now, I think this is a really great idea. So this is the one website we wanted to share again to make sure you have this resource and to be able to put together a project where everyone is describing what is going on in their city from first, per first person or from third person um, perspective. Now, we're, we've actually created a sheet that we can fill in. Now, again, this whole project is based on sustainability. So what we really want to emphasize is to pick out certain goals that you want to be able to target before you start this class, before you start this activity. And of course, we hit upon quite a lot of these, but we didn't go into details for some of them. For example, the clean water and sanitation. How do we have a system where the whole city has clean water system? What is it like? Is it gonna be in the city? Is it outside near the ocean? How is that going to work out? What we did focus on quite a lot is quality education and we all build our own schools, which was absolutely awesome. <laughs> and the next part would be, how do we have clean energy? How do we have affordable energy within the city? And what are some of the ways we can build this in to every single architecture? And of course, the last part would be to get climate actions, to be able to look further on, be able to look at long-term and put this all together. Now, what we did is actually create a little template for you. So after you start this, you have a goal, you start building a city and you're at the last phase where you wanna become, um, you wanna create an, a person living in the city and make it alive, then this is what we're going to be working with. Now, this is a very simple, simple example for you guys. It's basically character profiling. So we're gonna go through this together and to give you guys some ideas of how you can create someone. If you can recognize any of these characters above, they are actually in Strawbies right now. But that's just an example. You can draw them out, give them a name, give them a nickname, give them age, um, how big their family is, their gender, and list out their hobbies and interests. Now for the profession, I highly recommend getting them to think about two or three different professions that they might be excelling in. And then of course, what sustainable development goal they're focused on. After you write this down, have some fun with drawing the citizen out. Have some fun with imagining and creating them and be able to create what you believe would be a good character profile. Now, I, I chose the first one as a builder, as an engineer in a sense, because that's what we focused on first. But I wanna stretch your imagination and make you guys think about what if your character was a chef or a baker? How would he, within his profession, develop skills and be able to create sustainable approaches to what he's been doing? Think outside the box and be able to combine these two. What if you had an engineer who loved baking, which I'm sure many, many people love baking and love building at the same time. How would you miss and match those together? Now, after you have this profile created, you can do what Eric showed us last week, which is print it out into a scale. So if you wanna have a, a much smaller character, print it out so that's the size of your thumb. If you wanna have a much bigger character, print it out so it's the size of your arm. And be able to put that within your city so that it really starts to come alive and play some narratives. Now, once you have an idea of what it's like to be in the city with your character, I want, I want, we want you to really think about the next part, which is daily habits. Where do they go every day? How do they commute around the city? What are their long-term goals and aspirations? What are their short-term goals? How do they interact with everyone? Is everyone like telepathic? Do they have um, chips in their heads already? Or are they, or what, what kind of communication style? Um, and of course, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? Now that's just for fun. I want to really emphasize on making sure people understand strength is the key part that we'll be talking about. Um, and weaknesses is just an idea of like, what can you become better in? 
Okay. Now, how do they contribute to the city's sustainable development? I think that will be the final question and the most important one. Now, again, this template is just a fun template so you guys can really have some fun creating the narrative and the storyline and for them to actually collaborate, for everyone to start collaborating in. Now, the best part about all of this is how do we create this kind of sustainability for the future? And what we're going to talk about next is incorporating technology. Being able to have a smart city is going to be one of the key points. Now, if you want to have a smart city, you definitely need to have some cork bots. You definitely need to have some of the tools to make it smart. Now, that's the part where we're going to hand it over to Lindsay and Eric, where they're going to show you some amazing stuff that you're going to be able to do so that you can turn your city into a smart city and to actually build upon the mi mi macro, the bigger concepts, and the micro, the smaller concepts. Yeah. All right, awesome. So I would love to hand over to Lindsay for us to to be able to see some of these. And last thing, I will send you guys this PDF right now. You can download it also on Facebook. It will also be available. Thank you, James. All right. So, there we go. So Eric and I are gonna be showing a little bit between Corkbot and the robotic inventions for the microbit projects. So thinking about in your smart city, how you can start to optimize perhaps um, industrial, uh, thinking about using technology for innovation. Uh, so thinking about these tools that you can create to optimize your city. So for example, if you wanted to create a way that your city can be built up, using um, like maybe improving certain resources like sewage, water treatment, as well as um, think about resource consumption or thinking about how to build on your city using construction. So you can start to you know, use technology as a way to, you know, to create a model of creating a smart city. So like if you're not familiar, we have a wonderful electronic board called the Corkbot, which Eric will be showing you more in depth later. And we have another one where it is the new robotic inventions for the microbit board. So if you are familiar with microbit, microbit is a really powerful pocket-sized computer that has a lot of capabilities. And the robotic inventions for the microbit board that we've created is a way of adding a servo motor to microbit creations. So we have a really wonderful activity that I will be posting very shortly in the chat about creating a robotic crane. So Strawby is one of the one of the great things that we can produce with uh, our construction set is that you can create these mechanical structures and you can move it by hand, pulling a linkage or operating by a handle system. But perhaps you want to make it, you want to optimize your construction. So thinking about how you can, you know, implement that. So, you know, you can use the, the um, sorry, the robotic inventions for the micro, robotic inventions for the micro bit and connect to your, your crane construction here and implement as part of your structure. So we have these like building instructions and also the code that's online as well. So I'll be po uh, posting that a little bit later. So you can see using the buttons to kind of show a model of a crane, but you can also modify the linkage. You can also use this as kind of a base model to use and build other sort of smart city constructions. So Eric, can you show us a little bit more about your inspirational, um, your inspiration about creating a solar panel using Corkbot and the light sensors? Yeah, I'm gonna show a bit because one thing that, we, that there's lots of things to uh, to to address here, and I actually wanted to show how easy it is to make something mm -hmm. that feels kind of smart. Uh, because what's what's something my, that's kind of smart? Yeah, that, that's what I'll talk about. I'll show it <laughs> because you get it because the smartness comes from where it's applied. It mm -hmm. can be just a very basic function, but when it's applied in the right context, it becomes smart. So. I mean, we can make something super, super complex and that might appear smart, but it's not really good in the context because it uses more energy, et cetera. But I just wanted to show what, what I have been trying to do with, with the, from my point of view with the system uh, is to make it really fast to and engaging to actually make one first prototype mm -hmm. and then start changing that. So I'm gonna shift to the camera from top and then show you how we hack one of the houses from last episode mm -hmm. within, uh, within two, one or two minutes, I hope. 
uh, into becoming a semi-smart structure. Uh, but because what we what I actually missed last week to say is a lot of the smartness comes from the imagination of how it's used, what's the context, what's the scale. So why, what I forgot to say when I made those little figures is how much the house changes or what the structure is, you know, with your with your imagination of that scale. But now let's uh, move on to uh, the top camera and I will show you something that I hope you recognize from last week. So I'm getting better and better at this multi-camera stuff. So this is uh, a smart house. <laughs> What's smart about it, Lindsay? No, <laughs> no, but it's, it's, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, in our imagination, it could be super smart. Uh, I hope you all see this. So, so I put some brains next to the house here. Uh, and this is the, the thing is that you don't have to do anything really advanced. It's a very fast process. Once you know basically how to use the robot and the, the servo, uh, you can just snap it into your house that you had. So let's just try and see what's on this code. So I snap on the motor and I snap in uh, my, my robot. And this here is a little light sensor that's just standard size. And I snap it in and it's on here. Uh, and I'll actually show you a bit of the code here later. So now we have something that's like, it's, it's active. So we'll see something happens when I, well, let's see if I can, you see that the servo arm is moving depending on what the, what, how much light is let into it. So this is where your imagination comes. Where, what could I use this for? Uh, and what could be good to know that there's a lot of, like there's a lot of light coming in, what do we want to do? This might vary in your, in your head. So what I wanted to show is how fast, for example, we can let kids just prototype a little sunroof uh, that will adjust to the amount of sun, which in the end, in the context, uh, for example, imagine you're somewhere where uh, you, you want to automatically reduce the, uh, the heat in the house by actually just having something that's smart and spin. So I'm gonna just show you how I built a piece of cardboard. Uh, yeah, you get how this is done. This is done with one of my most advanced tools, the pencil here, which is a really, really important tool. Everybody should have one all around the world. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I just make some holes for my, to be able to make um, a simple hinge. So it's a hinged structure. So I just wanted to give you some hints on, on like quick prototyping. And that is a, a couple of minutes tops to make also. So, and then I just snap it on. And now we have a hinged little thing. You get that? And then now the next thing is without doing anything fancy, we can just snap this into our, our structure. And basically the code makes this smart or not. So let's see, I actually don't know what it does exactly in this case. So there's some light coming from, uh, from the left. So now it actually lifts, when it's dark, it opens up the structure. And when it gets brighter, it fall, falls down. So it actually covers up the windows into the classroom that might be in here. So, you know, the imagination makes the structure smart and it's just a prototype. And that's what I wanted to reach. Like I want the students that play with this or invent things with this to be able to make a prototype with which they can convey their idea. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to work perfectly. I also actually really like when it doesn't work exactly the way they want to, but they actually realized what the problem was and what they might have to solve the next time. So this is a very simple project. Uh, it's a direct implementation. Uh, does anybody want to see the code? Should I even ask that or? I think you should definitely show the code. Oh, yes. yes. It's yes, an incredibly simple uh, code. So I will show, let's see if I share screen, share, boom. So you see, this is all of another one minute coding session. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you see the code uh, to, to the left here is, uh, we have the light sensor on the robot's uh, right arm. I don't know if you can see, yeah, you see it's actually there. So. Uh, yeah, and uh, I have calibrated it. So this is basically if something wouldn't work, you can twist this up and down, change the values. If the movement is too long, you just reduce the movement. A servo in our system can move between zero and one. And that's all you have. So if you want to reduce the range, you just change the values here. Super fast. Connect this to the servo output. So you see this is connected, uh, which 
this little symbol says that the value from uh, the, uh, oh, now I'm pointing on the screen here and doing stuff at the same time. I'm confusing myself. <laughs> but, but you get this, so that uh, the value from the light sensor is going directly to the servo. So nothing fancy at all. So we could do triggered movements. We could do all kinds of stuff. So incredibly simple code. But what I also want to show you is when I do prototypes, this block is very important. Uh, I have this, now it says 0 0.6, usually I put 0 0.5 in here. This is my calibration block. So on servo output number two, I always have the midpoint of the servo. So I can actually calibrate uh, where I want the movement to be and where I want the central point to be. So it's, for me, it's just way of quickly prototyping. So I'm gonna switch back to my to, to real world camera again. Can you see my table again? No? Yes, and also uh, Christine wanted to know if you can show the block code equivalent to that. Oh, well, maybe I can. Uh, it's actually slightly trickier. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Actually, we could. We can. Why not take the challenge and see how fast I would do it in the block? Uh, oh wait, now I went in my on my own. I'm going to share screen. So now we're going on on deep water because this 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 very the flow code is. Uh, perfect for these very, very quick uh, tests of something. So let's, if we want to do the same in a block program, uh, we, we need to listen to a sensor when the program starts. We have to have a forever loop. So that's the first complication. You have to have something that runs continuously. Uh, then we, let's see if we can have the value of light sensor. That's a very important block, so we need that. Let's go in and see. So we had it on the right arm of the robot. And let's see, we can set servo. It's actually not that hard. So <laughs> the only problem was doing the mapping. So I would have to, if we just do a direct thing, I would have to write some loops to do, uh, uh, to actually do the mapping between certain servo uh, points. Let's see if there's actually something that does that easier. No. So let's see the, the quickest way of doing this without the, making it too smart. What I would do in other, otherwise would be to use, use some if uh, loops to be able to make sure that we're not going outside of if, if I, for example, wanted to go between zero and 0 0.8, I would do that in an if loop here. But just for speed, I won't uh, go into that. I, unless somebody really wants me to do that, we could actually make the if loops too, probably, to actually keep within a certain amount of uh, numbers. But right now, set servo one to position to the value of the light sensor. Then I can actually change the rest mechanically in the system. That, did you, so you see, this is the very simple block program too. But the, the, the amazing thing is the effect it has in the real world. And then you start going into your smart if loops to make it not move too far because you don't want it to break the straws or you don't want it to break whatever cardboard structure you're making. And that's how you would do trial and error. And that's where the flow is very, very fast because I just changed the values immediately. Uh, so, so you can actually look at the flow program as a prototyping that you do before you make a very smart implementation in a structured block program. Does everybody follow my really fast rants here? <laughs> I think it's fine yeah. because uh, the code is fairly simple. Like if anything, yeah. it's like, you don't have to think, you don't have to feel demystified. Like it's demystifying uh, about programming that even though you might be making this complex structure, uh, yeah. just a small amount of code blocks is all you need. Yeah, I, I mean, this, you see the implementation makes it complex and the combo, they're still very fast to achieve, it's very fast to achieve something interesting. Uh, then to achieve exactly what you want, that's the thing. Once you've done this test and it does something slightly wrong, that's when the students have the pull for learning how to do it, how to figure it out. Because you don't have to tell them to solve that. They will go all in solving it because it's fun, because they want to show their prototype. So that's, that's the thing. That's our idea of actually introducing uh, code and programming in a very interesting sense where they learn the basics of writing an if loop. So if uh, value of light sensor is higher than five, uh, you set the value variable to, uh, or like, you know, higher than a certain value, you set the variable yourself with an if loop. So there's lots of uh, ways of, uh, of managing this. So Eric, probably, yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted oh. to ask like a question because I know we've actually worked with this project a little bit, um, the using making a solar panel for a smart yeah. city. 
And I was thinking about the context of how you would apply this. Like, you know, like we use a solar panel to like traditionally to think about, you know, gathering energy, you know, using solar energy as a resource. So I'm thinking about like some of the sustainable development goals about, you know, trying yeah. to, re, you know, have a lot of renewable energy. And what you're introducing is moving the servo motor. So I'm like yeah. thinking about the application of why you would, what would be the purpose of this, the, the solar panel from like shifting using the linkage of the so, straw be connected to the server motor. Can you talk about that more? Let's go back. I'll actually go back to uh, stop sharing here. And, uh, and I'll, I'll actually can show you, uh, I'll, let's post the code in block that does the exact same thing uh, for, for people who want to see it afterwards. And I'll write the code in block, but it takes a little bit it actually is slower. That's the reason I, I avoid it now. It, it's still not maybe more than five minutes, but five minutes out of this time. Let's so, so this was a very simple implementation, single sensor. What if we look at the solar panel project that we made for, uh, this is a way of showing that by having something moving, uh, and there's actually a lot of caveats to this. You don't want to move all the time because then you're probably using way more energy than you're saving by actually getting the solar panel to adjust to where the sun is. So you see this project is a solar panel that will shift uh, from side to side following the cycle over zenith, <laughs> the sun, because so this is actually for a project we did in Ghana. So we put out 50 of these on the ground and show that we can pick up so much more energy by following the sun. Uh, and then we update it every five minutes. So you don't have to update every second because then you hear this little buzzing in the servos and that is using energy. But let's fire this one up and show how our solar panel project works. So, and I can show the code for this one too. So um, I just wanted to show that even the simple single uh, sensor is a smart way. You can use that. You actually only need, if you know that the sun is gonna go this way, it actually is, is enough with one sensor. But let's take the panel here. So you see now, where's the sun in this uh, setting? It's over here. There is a fake sun <laughs> in the, the light source that I have next to me. So we, when I cover that, it goes to where the most light is coming, which is the indirect light from the roof. Uh, so if I twist it, it should fold over to the light source. So uh, instead of <laughs> changing the light source today, I, I turned the system. So you follow how, how it works? So this is a, and then we made the students, they made an array of these panels. Obviously this doesn't have a solar panel on it. Uh, but if we had a solar panel on it, we could also measure what the voltage is and then go to where we get the highest voltage rating uh, every five minutes. So we would do the same thing without having a light sensor, but basically the solar panel would be the light sensor. Uh, so I, I I see, so I see a question here that comes up. Why does the solar panel need energy to move since the sun moves the same direction? Can gravity, you, you could, so uh, the, the solar panels, they usually, they're very heavy equipment most of the time. So that's why they actually use some hydraulics and pretty big motors and stuff. So they usually need some energy, but there is almost always surplus energy very close to the solar panel. So. The only problem would be if the panels are like doing this vibration movement where you have lots of energy losses and the motors are working way too much. So that's why we would keep a low. We have no problem with energy at the solar panel source. You won't lose anything there. Uh, but if you move it all the time, you might lose some stuff. So do uh, you want to see the code for this one too? And that I actually have both in block and in uh, Yeah, <laughs> in we would flow. definitely love to see it. Yeah, so uh, let's go in. And you see, uh, one thing I just want to mention, when I built, you saw the first build, I just snapped it into the structure. Uh, so this one is just snap on. And mm -hmm. then it's just a question of figuring out the linkage. And we will have lots of inspirational linkages. This is a very simple, or very, very simple. It's not super simple, but oh yeah, I like moving them. This is very magical. So now I'm mesmerized. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I always, almost in all structures, I build these rails for the servo mount so I can slide the motor and calibrate the position without having to cut any straws or anything. I can make the correct position by just sliding my, uh, my motors around and then, then we have it calibrated for this light source. So that's the first thing that I wanted to mention that it's a very good way of working and showing that we use some standardized 
solutions to to uh, put my uh, the, this rails uh, <laughs> in there. Uh, and then let's go into the code. So and uh, as as you kind of uh, change screens, I wanted to point out that in your first prototype, you know, with your making making that cube with that small yeah. panel, that you're using only one light sensor yeah. on that one, and on this on the solar panel prototype, kind of like the second iteration, there's two light sensors. And I know you'll go over that very shortly, yeah, but I want to point that out. Exactly. You see that there's two light sensors and that's just, we could manage with just one, but we wouldn't, then you kind of have to know where it's put in the world. This one will automatically sort that out. So you could just throw out your solar panel uh, module here and it's going to find the best way of, of mm -hmm. facing the sun. <clears throat> um, so let's go into my share screen. And then, hello, let's go back. Oh, I can save this so I can modify it later. Uh, this was solar roof block, which is uh, no pun intended, but uh, when we're talking about cities, <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, I'll go out to my code so that you can see, I have to check so I don't have any weird code here, but it's pretty good. Uh, so, uh, sol panel snub. This is the flow version of uh, the solar panel. That's what's actually running in the panel. So uh, everybody sees the screen now. Um, I haven't done a good. Yep, you're good. My calibration block. This is very important for this particular project because I want the solar panel to be completely flat uh, when we're at uh, the mid range of this thing. So I do the calibration first, physical setup. I can show that also. And then we have the light from the left leg uh, and it, this sensor gives you a zero and a one or from zero to one. And then we have the light sensor from the right leg and this one, uh, when it's minimum light, you get a zero. And when it's maximum light, you get a minus one, so negative one. So this means that we actually can add these two, vari these two variables and know where we are, uh, where actually the, this, this gives us something that we can map out. So the, the lowest value we can get when it's most light from one direction, you will have negative one. This is when there's no light on the left leg uh, and there's lots of light on the right leg. We have zero minus one. Then we get a minus one here, which is the minimum value, follow? And if we get zero on this leg and uh, one on this leg, we get a plus one as the maximum. Uh, this is too much movement for the servo to handle, so we map that over. This is why we use a converter. So I want it to move between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8, and we send it into servo one. So once again, we show how we use the flow program to prototype something that's a very fast, agile, and, uh, and smart system. Uh, so this is a, uh, once you get, this might feel very abstract first, but uh, you'll see that we've seen so many interesting solutions to this. I've challenged lots of different age groups to figure out how to do this. Uh, so this was the flow version. Um, I will go back to the block. So we go back here and we look at the solar roof block. That's, was that the one? No. Trash boom car. Oh, I didn't save the one that's blocked, but let's do this. I'll upload because I have a something, I think. Uh, oh, wait a second. I'm going to have to find. Ah, that was too bad. You know, I showed you guys this before. I'm going to see if I can find it because I don't know where I have it. Oh, there I had it. Solar panel block. Oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, back. At least I'm talking all the time. Do you see me now? Yep, we see you now. Yeah. So this one, <laughs> we have, once again we haven't mapped the maximum and bin minimum value. So I did a really fast version of this. So this is doing the same thing where we have the value of the light sensor on the left leg minus the value of the light sensor on the right leg uh, plus one divided by two. So this hurts the brain a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if you follow, <laughs> but it, it's a very simple thing. You, if you test this block, we can actually upload this uh, code also so you can try it. Uh, but uh, 
so these are both giving uh, yeah yeah this actually works and then you have to wait so this is actually where it, this block program would be smarter because we can use the server movement more rarely so we can have an update or every 10 seconds and one minute so it shows that sometimes the block code like this can be faster at doing certain implementations than uh, than on the other one, uh, uh, the, the flow. So the flow has its flow has its very. It's actually made to be able to make artificial intelligence and similar things really fast neural networks. Uh, it doesn't look like that fancy, but once again, this one is good for uh, for very industrial applications like doing something like this, and then you just have to write some more if uh, if loops to keep the values within a certain range that you want. So that's uh, basically uh, what I wanted to show uh, in terms of smart cities. But obviously, these are two very simple functions reacting to to the light. Uh, let's come back in to my face, maybe. <laughs> now you haven't seen me in a while. I'm talking all the time. Hello. <laughs> uh, there's lots of ways of, I, I'm just showing two very fast implementations. So the imagination makes it smart. It's not the code in the beginning. It's how you apply the code. And that's what I really want to do. And then the more you do, the more you realize that we have a problem, it's moving too far. Then you have to solve it in code. And that's actually the fun part uh, of doing it because then you're on something, you're onto something, some, you see it, and then you may, might want different states. Uh, and yeah, yeah. All these ideas come up once you once you try something. So I would do if I would do a smart city with this, you could do ways of making automatic lighting, uh, saving energy to actually not use too much. You can use sensing that there's a flood, flooding, closing floodgates because that's something that will happen. Uh, all these things. So it's the imagination of implementation, and then you do a, a prototype. And I really believe that physical prototyping is a way of understanding so much more, so much faster, uh, which is the reason I want, I want this to be out there. That's the reason I invented most of this. <laughs> so yeah, um, really fun. Any, uh, any further questions on, and obviously you could immediately come up with ideas of other implementations of these functions of using the light sensor or any of the sensors that we use, so touch sensing or, or actually non-touch sensors that we also can use that we don't now it's very relevant where you know that touch interfaces, they spread uh, germs. So we want to do a non-touch interface. And how would you do that? And sometimes mm -hmm. there's multiple ways. There's always so many ways you can, <laughs> you know, but, but, but one way would be making a, a light switch. So when you cover this, you actually turn on something or you open a door so you can make all these very simple uh, prototypes. It's not about making advanced, the advanced stuff is in here. I've said that so many times now that I'm hurting my own brain, but uh, it, <laughs> I wanted to really come across because I've heard all these amazing inventions come up. When you host a, a, a classroom experience like this, you will be surprised as long as you actually leave some of it up to the imagination that the code isn't too complex where they start, but where the end, you don't know. You, you don't control the end result. You control the start and then they start modifying it, hacking it, the structure or the code. Uh, and then once they want to achieve something, they will start Googling other people's code and trying to make it complex because obviously it won't be directly implemented in their system. They have to do a, a translation. And that's also a key skill, how to modify something that's online to something that works for you. So that's another future skill that comes automatically. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I don't know. I know. No, it's a, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really um, plausible thing to think about that, yeah. you know, you, you don't really think of using coding as like, you know, I'm going to use a light sensor and implement it in my city. I'm yeah. going to be really thinking about the application. Like, you know, the, the solar panel is actually one of the, the best examples of this that, you know, while we have cell, solar panels, we tend to think about, you know, more of the obvious route of, renewable energy, gathering energy, storing energy, you know, and then connecting it in a way that can implement and light up the city. But also thinking about what you were mentioning with like using hydraulics, using some sort of, you know, mechanical structure to make it move, but make it automated so you can actually get maximize the amount of energy input 
that you can have throughout the day. Because I remember also in Ghana, you were talking about uh, creating like solar panels in Ghana would be different than in Sweden because yeah. of the, how the sun rises and sets in different positions. And could you remind me in Sweden, what is it? When does that, where, how, where does the sun Oh, we had a, so, we go, yeah, so because it goes much lower, depending on yeah. where, what time of year it does. So you, we built panels. I don't have one of those here, but we had to have the, the axis of movement to be slightly tilted. We, so it, but it, that was also a great lesson for both mm -hmm. of us to, to look at how we would follow the sun, because the sun doesn't move the same way across the planet. Uh, because obviously it's spinning around its axis and it's, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting to, to just to, to show that kind of implementation to understand but uh, I uh, if we just look at the model uh, I can go over here let's see <laughs> you want to see the the thing and I can maybe yeah let's see the model again the thing. <laughs> There's because because what I what I found really interesting is that you know depending where your city is you're trying to think about you know where you are geographically and you know something like solar panels, you know if you if you have like a large amount of darkness throughout the time of the year, like if you're in a position global position in the world where maybe it's dark 23 hours of the day, I mean still investing in renewable energy sources is necessary, I think, yeah. for for a more sustainable you know city future. But trying to think about how you would maximize maybe that single hour of sunlight, but also looking at other alternatives because. Yeah. The beautiful thing about Sweden, for example, is that you have um, like longer periods of sun sunlight during the summer. So you yeah, can yeah. really maximize like, you know, renewable energy gathering from the solar, from solar energy. But so, during the dark periods of the year, the, the periods where maybe the sun is setting a little bit earlier or you have very, or if you're in more northern Sweden, like in the, you know, the Arctic north, yeah. then suddenly you have to really think about the different times, time, you know, times of the year, the seasonal Exactly, and but for for in in Sweden, the at the summertime the sun just doesn't set. But on the other hand, it's so low that the energy content is actually a bit less. Uh, but but it's still good. We we've been doing a lot of interesting things. Uh, obviously, nighttime it's less, but in the daytime it's still still pretty okay. Uh, I was showing that that the basically the only thing you needed to solve was tilting it. So when we did it, we made made a completely different structure, but you could easily get off with just making uh, a strut in the back of this structure and then you solved it. So there's always a complicated way or a less complicated way of, of solving it. And we could, for example, if we want to have a two axis system to make it very efficient, we could just put a servo here that tilts in this direction too. So you do a search movement and then you have tilt in, in two axis, but that's getting a bit over the top, but some students will want to do that. And that, that's when I want them to be able to, to try it and make a quick mock-up. Don't go too, fa too far. Don't spend way too much time. I, I still want them to do a small plan, but I don't want to, you know, because that's the problem in school is getting the, the amount of hours connected to each other to actually be able to explore something real. That's why we wanted to make the, the process fast so they actually can go through some loops. Uh, so it's not to be able to be finished fast. It's to be able to go through a couple of ideas. Um, so, but you saw how I just tilted it here and uh, then it's followed. I should have had a regular flashlight, but my cell phone is probably enough. But uh, you see how it's following the fake tiny sun. <laughs> so that's basically it uh, to, 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 um, to be able to adapt to the Swedish low hanging sun <laughs> that is also very sad winter time when we have three hours of sunlight and my my cousins they have three or four hours of day uh, <laughs> yeah uh, show a close-up of the servo on the rails yeah, if you are able to but if yeah, if you yeah. cannot we can also take some no, photos as well what the, what do if there's anything in particular you want to see uh, you see how it's put here uh, and then the position obviously adjusts when this is on the surface. It, now, because I'm lifting it, you see the linkage is moving differently. But when we do this with students, I actually, we, uh, they build one of these each. So you can have an array, a long array connected to one servo and they will all move at the same time, just using one uh, servo motor. So it's not about that. That's also efficiency. We don't need 50,000 motors. We need one motor to control a big linkage. If this is in rest, 
there's lots of cool ways of, uh, of adjusting it. And then, but the rails is just, and then you, I, the, my connection here is just put there with friction. It, this can slide. Uh, you could probably be smarter on where to put it, but I, I want to keep all these in a sketch state. Uh, because a lot of times models are very advanced and then they you have less agency in in modifying it to your now I'm modifying it live just to see if this actually uh, this works really well because the angle is not too far off so this is probably better because now it's locked <laughs> so you see an improvement immediately <laughs> that's the thing I, I want to leave the space open for for improvements in all all kinds of shapes and forms uh, especially for the students to outperform uh, me. So now my nephew has started Strawbee's class here in Sweden. So he has, he's just called me. So I'm going to go over and do a, a, a small splashdown for them. I'm really happy that they, they've been using it for four or five years in his school before he came today. So he started yesterday. And the first day at school in technical, in their technic, tech, or technology class was Strawbee's. So he was like, what? That's my uncle. So, <laughs> so I'm happy that he got to be proud for once. Of the crazy uncle. <laughs> I think everyone is proud of you, crazy <laughs> uncle or not. I mean, I we think that they are. Yeah. Yes, I think that the way you 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 present uh, the mixture of physical computing, physical coding, uh, like in the real like in yeah. real life, with kind of like the simple shapes. Like if we kind of look at the solar panel, your your final well, I don't want to say final prototype because that seems. Yeah. <laughs> silly to say but but i see like kind of the the assortment of different shapes like you have the cardboard rectangle you have like these two rectangles um for the base of the strawby structure yeah. in your first prototype you have like a strawby's cube kind of like the building block that you used that you showed last week where you exactly. were building the the the, build, the city that you were using these very simple structures as bases and kind of you know adding these small linkages these small yeah. mechanisms but you are allowing it basically the ability to move and shape reshape and I think that it's a, it's actually a really good um, application of how we really want to learn to code that, you know, using only three blocks or three yeah. or up to five nodes in flow programming for Quarkbot, yeah. I think is really the way to get started. You know, you don't have to have this very complex coding project. It can actually be like a very simple, uh, a very simple like idea that yeah, you're sketching, you're using code as to sketch just like with strawbies as well. Exactly, but and then then now I'm talking. You see my hand. This is my new mouth. <laughs> my <laughs> Your hands are the best. Hi. Hi. So, uh, but uh, this is the thing where where I'm, I can't do that because I'm laughing myself. I'm coming back into uh, my the other camera. Uh, that that my that's the dream is actually to use. We want to be a shoe in to to show the power of code without having to overwhelm mm -hmm. them with complex code. For example, making a game is very complex. They will be able to do it. Some students will nail it immediately because they've done it at home. And that's the big problem. But the, this actually, this thing, uh, it's like a pressurizing system between different levels also in the classroom because some might be mm -hmm. more analytical and some are more creative just building something. And then you have an uh, analytical kid seeing the chaos that another kid built. And then the combination becomes way greater than the, so the sum of the parts, which is very interesting. Uh, uh, one of the goals that I really want to want to 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 show, or what, one of my also uh, dream cases when I see it applied in school. Um, so how how cross uh, cross skill teams actually work together? A even though uh, obviously the second dream is that I want them to just dive deeper and deeper into this code because code is about this is a it's a state of mind. You just continue, you just go through mm -hmm. your loops modifying the code, making it more and more complex, which is why when you start with something incredibly simple like this, the agency to make it complex is theirs. They will start doing that and adding another thing. I want to have another button. How do I do that? And then it's, it's actually also easier as a teacher to facilitate that, uh, those kinds of experiences. That's why we want to reduce complexity in code in the beginning and that let the students make it complex. And it's still going to be fun. Like they're going to come up with lots of ideas. I'm going to flip something over. I'm going to make, uh, you know, th there's so many ideas that pop up immediately. Uh, so, uh, and we've started out with very simple, like I, uh, another activity we did with the solar, uh, with the light sensor, just use, like that's one of the things as a, as a creative, it's interesting to just dive deep into a single sensor. What can we actually apply it for? 
So another thing is obviously robot eyes, and then we want to see what the robot sees. So the first thing we did was our sheet uh, with the light sensor, with a, just logging what light a robot would see in the room because maybe using just a single light sensor would be enough to know where in the room we are, which is very interesting, for example, if you have a... So, so we do all these things, discovering what a robot would see, and that might sound like a not-so-fun activity, but you, just, you should hear the screams when they start like calculating and mapping out the grid. The room has a lot of different light states, <laughs> and, uh, and then they know what, they, what the robot should be able to see later and how it should react. Uh, so for example, you could have a robot baby with, connected to a speaker and the corner is the darkest place. So when it, it would scream, nobody puts baby in the corner when, when it's in the corner. I like that kind of fun, <laughs> fun code. <laughs> you're, a, you're a silly creative coder sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I, that's, I know it's so much more engaging and they see this and they come up with their own mm -hmm. idea and they implement it and that's the most powerful experience you can have. And then that gives them the agency. They invented it, they started. But obviously we need the handrails in the beginning. That's why, as you said in the first state, we have lots of base models that are very simple. We can make the solar panel is a base model, for example. And then you could apply that in different ways. What is it if it's vertical? What if it's, if it's standing like this? What is it now? What could it be? Uh, mm -hmm. You could have automatic door that opens when something passes it. You know, there's lots of things to, to be able to do. It could be like a sign, you know, like on sometimes on uh, the traditional school buses, there's like a stop sign that automatically opens up when the bus is, yeah. is like stopped and it opens the, the doors as entry. Mm -hmm. So it could be a way to show signage as exactly. well. And, and once again, this is another thing that is super important that that's why we want all the kids to explore and describe what it could be just by twisting and turning the object. It becomes different uh, combined with their context. Like you had the context of knowing that this is how a sign would be uh, like how they can work on a school bus. Uh, somebody might have seen some other application and then that you just have this wonderful melting pot of all these great uh, ideas and then you'll see what pops out. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I like showing that that dream state, but it's, a, <laughs> it's a, but, uh, that's the biggest wow moments. Uh, I don't, I, I can't remember what was the best. I've seen I, there's so many great things when I've been out doing school. So I try to just remember. I know there was one thing, one time I was just shocked by the simplicity of something, but uh, no, it's too, it's a jumble. <laughs> 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 but uh, we, you know the we. When I, yeah, the, the umbrella project yeah, or not, not you know, mm -hmm. the, we made the automatic umbrella where I did, uh, when I wanted it to automatically fold up when it was, uh, when it was a dark sky, because that was my bad idea of uh, how I would make an automatic umbrella. Mm -hmm. So, but, so I gave them the challenge, but the team that made it wrong, it fo folded up when it was uh, uh, light, brighter. Mm -hmm that implementation was much better when you used it in the real world because even though it's very dark skies it's much brighter in the sky than on the ground so when they held your umbrella downwards it was folded up but when you pulled it up it folded up automatically because the sky was so much brighter so their implementation was a failure according to my plan but mm -hmm. a much better much bigger success when we actually used it uh, uh, outdoors which was I, I love that, uh, to actually embrace the, the, the failure in terms of using, pointing it up towards the light, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was supposed to, it was just amazing. So that's one of the uh, moments that I, I cherish most. And now I use that because automatically that, the failed solution was way better than my original solution. <laughs> I love it. Love yeah. it. Awesome. And, and of course, uh, with, the, with the micro, well, micro bit has so many wonderful things, the tilt sensing and uh, uh, which I would also implement them, for example, using remote controls. And I put, uh, uh, I made a, an automatic hand puppet. You know, you showed the, when you have the two micro bits that can communicate through radio. So when you mm -hmm. do one movement, the other one moves. So I put the little micro bit on my hand and then another one on the head of a robot. And then I could make this hand puppet that was mm. radio controlled basically. And I love yeah. hand puppets. I we, do like have a, we do have a short example of that in the robotic, uh, the robotic crane with BBC micro bit activity yeah. on the learning platform. We do have like a small uh, video example of that. Although yeah. what you made was much, much bigger. 
a very yeah, large yeah. scale crane. Big, big, or big, big person with a big head that moves. Now I'm actually doing an experiment that I hope will also be shared somewhere where I'm going to be in a first person view. So I'm, I'm gonna have a robot head on me uh, that controls the head on another robot that's in a parachute that will jump off of a high building here in Gothenburg. <laughs> so it's completely legal. It's not me jumping, it's gonna be <laughs> a robot and I will control the head so I can actually look. I have a first person view system that you, they usually use for drones. But that's me playing. But I believe in the power of play uh, in school and, uh, and in continued learning because lifelong learning is also the future. So when I, I want to continue exploring stuff. Well, I definitely yeah. say that you have enough content for planars forever. Classes, <laughs> activities for yeah. our learning platform. <laughs> you, know, you, you have time. many ideas. I mean, yeah. we all have great ideas. Everybody I, has, we just need to show, we just need to nudge people to get started implementing the ideas, mm -hmm. not making them too complex first. Just actually Im implement and try it and see. So that's why we, we've been, I've been trying to say, I don't, I don't know how much we've showed that online yet, but what, I don't want them to make a really super polished, super functional prototype. I want them to be able to make a prototype with which they can describe the idea they had. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. It's not, it's not about making something that's just end all perfect prototype. It's like this, this is what my idea was. I wanted it to do this and uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's my dream. We'll make it happen, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we have reached the end of uh, part four of the city building and the sustainable development goals class. James, do you have anything to share? Any thoughts about how this class has gone for you and some ideas that you have? Definitely. So the one thing I would say is it's a lot of fun to collaborate. As you can see, we all have different perspective of how to build a city and what to focus on. Now, if you could collaborate with one another, it really brings it alive and you get a lot of inspiration. As you can see, we got a lot of inspiration from Lindsay when she first built her school and the prototype. And then again with Eric, um, I think that's gonna be one of the key, key components. And I highly suggest for you guys to be able to let us know when you would like to be able to start this uh, activity, what particular day, and we can, reach out and match you guys up with certain teachers who are also interested in starting something like this at around the same time. So you can have a conversation and a thread going on and to be able to build off of each other's energy. I think that's going to be crucial. Um, it's really fun. It's really fun when you can actually build upon it, each other's energy, right? Like as we're building upon Eric's energy, we're like, Oh wow, we can do this. And then we can see Lindsay's prototype, like, wow, that's amazing. And then we can see how I've implemented some, um, character narratives and be like, yeah, that's actually a really good idea to f for us to also teach about empathy. Then we can really understand how to go to the next step, which is build a city that can actually solve a lot of problems. Um, so I think that's going to be super fun and let us know when you guys want to start um, these activities, how long it's going to be, if it's a four week program, if it's a four day program and get in touch with Lindsay. Um, and also, of course, when you're doing this, definitely email us or um, have a thread in Facebook where you're just communicating with us. Um, and Lindsay and I will be happy to, to, to help out. And of course, Eric was, is gonna have amazing tips and tricks and hacks. So anytime you wanna ask any questions, please let us know. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. No, it was nothing. I just, no, just chiming in. That's my, <laughs> confusing everyone. Cool, I have cool, to cool, head cool, out cool. because now they're calling from my, uh, I have to pick up my daughter today. Awesome. <laughs> We're going to fix her cardboard submarine at home. Important. Nice. Oh, <laughs> nice lovely. Nice, well, nice. thanks nice. for joining us, Eric, these last uh, two weeks, but thank you very much for showing from the inventor's desk, your process, you the coding. It has been a wonderful pleasure working with both you and ja James and Eric, uh, especially bringing out the different perspectives because uh, I, I think what's really important to, to end the, the city building class is thinking about yes and kind of building off the ideas of others as well as, you know, you could make your own independent city, but just imagine, you know, when we're back in, back in school, um, you know, given the circumstances, how you can actually create small neighborhoods. So you can actually start to think of your city as a neighborhood or neighboring cities that make a large continent, a country of individual cities or a, an entire continent. So yep. the, the possibilities are endless. And even though we're working remotely, you can see that we were starting to build our own cities 
and even on a global scale because we're based in three different countries right yeah. now <laughs> you know that we're able to to expand yeah. on these cityscapes you know and again you don't have to be limited to just using strawbies but using materials that you have at home bottles mix of strawbies tape and scissors with paper it's a lot of possibilities here and uh, we would love to see more of your projects. So I just uh, posted the Strawbies Educators Facebook group. So you can uh, post and share your photos from your from yourself or from your students. But thank you very much for joining us. And of course, awesome. all resources, links that we shared are gonna be posted in the Google Slides. Awesome. Thank you so thank you much, again. everyone. <laughs> we, we're, we have an amazing time. If you guys have any other ideas of what you would like to see, please reach out to us so we can help implement and execute with you guys. All right. So I know Eric has to head out as well. Yeah. Have an amazing day, everyone. Bye. We will see you guys soon. Bye-bye.